the thought of anxiety, oppression, anything. Uh, it, even if you're up the top of the hill or you're in the valley, wherever your journey is today, just give it all to Him these next few days. Amen. God is good and He's always faithful. Amen. He said He'll never leave us nor forsake us. Amen. And we, and we are examples to that. Amen. Thank you, Lord, for bringing us here this evening. To have your way in Jesus' name. We speak to your children. And we ask that you place your blood on this cap and let your angels camp round about this place. And we ask God that you would minister to whoever it is you, you, you would want to minister to tonight. Amen. You know every heart, every mind, every every request, every petition. You see everything, all the things that we've gone through this week and everything that is still in our mind that may be troubling us. God, whether it be family, friends, whoever it may be that we bring up to you, we ask that you would work on our behalf in Jesus' name. And we give you this service this morning of this evening. I ask that you would teach, amen, and you would use me as you would a, a microphone this evening. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Come on, church. Do a little better. Come on. Let's raise the hand. Let's give the voice. Let's give some praise, some worship. Let's offer up something to the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, God, for being good and faithful and strong and forgiving and patient and kind and loving. Thank you for being God and King. Thank you for being able to see ahead of us. For being able to know what's coming. Amen. Ahead of us. Thank you, God, for your protection. And thank you, God, for your help that you send to us. Thank you, God, for pre-planning all the things in our lives. Thank you, God, for the people that you put in our lives. Amen. To help us through these times. Thank you for your word that comforts us and strengthens us. Strengthens us. Thank you for your word and the men and the people you placed in our lives to be an example and to teach us and to lead us. God, you have everything in control tonight, God. Thank you tonight. We already thank you for the victory. We already thank you for the salvation. We already thank you for the healing. We already thank you for helping and moving tonight. We thank you already for the victory. Hallelujah. Thank you, God. You're worthy of praise. Honor tonight in Jesus' name. Have your way in this place in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Remain standing and turn with me to the book of 2 Corinthians. We'll do our offering and our afterwards. Amen. Everybody there, 2 Corinthians chapter 8. I know some of the Bibles have like a little title or uh, an inscription over the beginning chapter. Does anybody have that? What does yours say? The collection of the Lord's people. The collection of the Lord's people? Well, I have Second Corinthians chapter 8? Yes. The, the, duty of giving. the duty of giving, the collection of people, and any others? Okay. These are all good. Macedonia's giving, yes. Mine says, Excel in giving. But mine is out of the New English Version. It ain't normally I read out of the New King James Version, but I'm going to be reading out of the New English Version because it makes so much more sense. Not that the New King James does it, but I like the way the New English Version puts it. And it says in verse 1, And now, brothers and sisters... We want you to know about the grace 
that God has given the Macedonian churches. Verse 2, in the midst of a very severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. Verse 3, for I testify that they gave as much as they were able and even beyond their ability entirely on their own verse 4 and they urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service to the Lord's people amen verse 5 and they exceeded our expectations. They gave themselves first of all to the Lord and then by the will of God also to us. I want to talk about reaping what you sow tonight. Amen. God have your way in Jesus' name. Amen. You may have a seat for a moment. And now, brethren, says, this is Paul speaking, Paul writing, says, brothers and sisters, I want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. You know, what we read is just an action-packed couple of verses. And there are some great things that have happened in just those five Verses, Amen. There was some great things said about the Macedonian church. Amen. I don't know if you caught all of that, but look at what verse 1 Paul begins out by saying. He says, there is something that I want you to know about. There is something that I need to tell you. There is something that I want to show you about the Macedonian church. You know what, for Paul to start out a chapter like that, there had to have been something that was so obvious about the Macedonian church. There had to have been something that was so noticeable about the Macedonian church where Paul said, there is something that I need to tell you about the Macedonian church. Paul noticed something about those people because it was probably obvious you could tell just, just walking into the city or walking into their church there was something different about them. It was hard not to notice. There was something these people had, Paul says, that I want to tell you about. Verse 1, I want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian church. Amen. Paul was saying, I need to show, I need to tell you about something. And what they did, the Macedonian church did to receive such grace from the Lord Almighty. Amen. Paul was talking to the Corinthian church. And he was telling them, I want you to know why the Macedonians were showered with grace. Grace, if you look in the dictionary, grace says, Grace is a free will and an undeserved favor of God. Free favor coming from the Lord and undeserved favor coming from God. So the Macedonian church, they had favor with the Lord. They found favor with God. You know when you're favored? You know any people that are favored that you notice that are just above favored? I know one or two people that are 
favored, but when you're favored, it seems like you're promoted. You're more often pushed ahead of everybody else. There's more opportunities, it seems like, available to you. And that everybody notices you. Everybody wants to be your friend. And somehow it seems like you're always selected and chosen to take advantage of the opportunities ahead of everybody else. Everybody likes you. Everybody wants to be your friend. You're promoted. Every, there's just something about you. You have favor with everybody. So how did the Macedonian church stop God and get his attention? What did the Macedonians do to get God's attention to pour grace out over that church? Amen. What did they do? Look at verse 2. Verse 2 says, in the middle of their very severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty in that wells up in them a rich generosity. Now hold up a minute. Does that make any sense to any of you? <laughs> in one sentence, the Macedonians are going through a severe trial and they're in deep poverty, but yet they are overflowing with joy. That doesn't make sense. Amen. Does that remind you of a scripture? Count it all joy when you fall into different types of troubles and trials and tribulations. What a perfect example of the Macedonian church going through all this turmoil, chaos, trouble, deep poverty, afflictions, and they were just overflowing with joy. Not to mention their deep poverty. That means they, they were so far down, they had hit rock bottom. They were dirt poor. That's got to mean that deep poverty. They were poorer than poor. They were going through some type of severe trial. Amen. They were living below the normal means, below the minimum, below the average standard of living. They were poor. They were like probably like beggars, begging for coins and dimes and nickels and change. Deep poverty, extreme trials. Yet they were overwhelmed with joy. What an example. You know what, for some of us tonight, maybe money is kind of tight for everybody here this evening, right now. But I don't think any one of us or any one of you is in deep poverty. Not that I can see or, or notice anyways. From here it looks like you're all doing pretty well. Amen. But the Macedonians, the Macedonians, in spite, think about it, in spite of their situation, in spite of what they were going through, in spite of where they were at, their joy, it says right there in verse 2, their joy was welling up within them not only well enough, but the Bible says overflowing with joy. They just didn't act like it. They just didn't put it on face. They didn't have, just because they were a church, they had to put on that church face. No, it was coming out from, you could see it. 
he could feel it and sense it. Paul, when he walked into that church, he noticed it and says, there is something about this church that you Corinthians need to hear about. They're on to something, this Macedonian church. Despite their trouble, they're full of joy. These Macedonians obviously knew something. They obvious, obviously understood something about their finances. This church obviously knew something about their money. They understood something about their giving. They knew something about their contributions to the things of God, to the church of God, to the people of God. They knew something about their finances and what they did with it and the result of it. Amen. Because in that next portion of Scripture, it says in their extreme poverty, in their extreme trial, and in their extreme joy, there wells up in them a what? What does your Bible say? My Bible says a rich generosity. Something welled up within the Macedonians that they just couldn't wait to give. They gave, they wanted to give. They gave like they had mountains to give. They gave like they had plenty. The Bible says they were richly generous. That means they were beyond generous. They gave more than what they had to. They were not only that, they were overly kind. They were overly happy. They were, they were overly joyous. They were richly generous. Amen. I want to be a part of church like that. Amen. To be filled with joy and having it pour out every cell in my body. And for people to sense that when they step into our church. Amen. Amen. Which brings me to my point tonight. <clears throat> you reap what you sow. That's been our lesson the last two or three Sundays. Reaping what we sow. When you reap, you put into something. And you get a return on whatever it is you buy into, you put into. Whatever it is that you plant. And come harvest time, you, you reap or you sow the harvest. Whatever it is that you planted, you get a fivefold, a tenfold, maybe even a hundredfold. Amen. Come harvest time. The Macedonians at this point may have hit a rough spot in their lives, but they obviously knew something about giving and sowing. No doubt that the Macedonians have seen this work. They obviously saw giving had Something behind it. They seen the results when people gave. They seen the results when people sold into the kingdom of God, into the things of God. They seen the results and it was evident to them. And that's what they hungered and desired, desired for. And that's what filled them with joy. Knowing the result of what their finances and how they handled it and how they gave and what how how they gave cheerfully. They knew there was benefits to that. Not only giving in general, but giving to the kingdom of God, the Macedonians knew there was something about giving to the kingdom of God. They knew something happened when you 
put the things of God priority number one in your lives. They knew that there was something when you put God first, his workers first, his people first, his ministry first. They saw something in giving to the church and the people of God and to God himself. Why else would they be so overwhelmed with joy? Look at what verse number four says. It says they pleaded urgently. They were pleading and begging urgently with Paul and the disciples. They were telling Paul, please let us give. Please let us give for the privilege of sharing in this service to the Lord's people. <laughs> Isn't that? Oh. Can we give, brother? Get out of our way, Paul. I want to give. <laughs> I want to be a part. I want to have that privilege of giving to my God. I want to have to give me that privilege. Paul, the disciples, get out of my way. Don't stand in my way of giving to the church, to, the, to my God. Allow me to, allow us the privilege to serve in this service to the Lord's people. What a declaration from the Macedonian church. <laughs> They were pleading to give. You know what they were saying when they were pleading? They were saying, let us give, Paul, and don't take from us what God would have blessed, would, would bless us with. Paul, don't stand, don't take from us what God would bless us with. In other words, don't stand in the way of our blessing. Because we want to give. And we know that the Lord blesses when His children give cheerfully. They knew that. They, the Macedonians, knew that when they gave to the ministry, when they gave to the church, that God was going to pour out a blessing. They knew that God was going to shower them and smear them with grace. These, this Macedonian church knew the principles of giving. The Macedonian church knew the principles of, of sowing, reaping. Amen. They understood the profits, the benefits, the rewards of giving to the things of God. They understood the work of God and, and why they, they, they contribute to it. They understood the work of God and how important it is and how real and how big and how great and how faithful and true God is to His Word. No doubt they had experienced. I know you and I have experienced, amen, when we were in our time of plenty and we were given and everything. A lot of us we've experienced, we've been down that road. We have an idea, yes? But the Macedonian church, they were overly excited about giving. They were overwhelmed with joy when they saw the opportunity to give. Verse 2, when they saw the opportunity, when they saw that offering basket going down the street, when they saw Paul probably had an offering bag on the tucked in his arm, that excitement welled up. Hey, look, look what Paul's got in his hand. We're going to give. I'm going, I'm going to run home. I'm going to get everything I got. I'm going to get my best. I'm going to call Brother Paul down, and I'm going to contribute what I have. I can't wait to give. God, I want that. I want that mindset. I want that mentality. I want to be an example of that well enough before everybody. 
looking for the opportunity and desiring the opportunity any place. It doesn't have to be in the church. It could be anywhere else. But, that, but for that excitement to well up within me when I know it's time to give to the Lord, to give to the things of God, to give to the ministry, to for it to well up in me. I want that. I want that mindset. That I want I want us to think in that way, to think down that way, that, that path, that, that, that mindset. When we see the offering plate coming to the front, we jump right up and be overexcited, full of joy. The Macedonian church, despite their deep troubles, Paul noticed they are overcoming with joy. And look at verse 3. Verse 3 says, They gave as much as they were able to give. Look what it says in the next part. And even beyond their abilities they gave. Look at the last part in verse 3. Entirely on their own. Paul didn't even have to mention an offering. Paul didn't even have to talk about finances. Paul didn't even have to teach or preach about finances. He didn't even have to say a word about it. Paul's probably thinking, that wasn't even my message today, but look at these people. They just can't wait to give. They're pleading urgently with me to just allow them to give. They gave as much as they were able and even beyond that. Do you get that beyond? Remember, these people are in deep poverty. Remember, they're going through the worst trial of their lives, probably. And yet they gave beyond what was expected of them. They gave even more of what they had. They freely gave they gave with a willing attitude. They could not wait for Sunday morning to roll around when, they, when it comes time to pay the pledge and the, the tithing and the offering. They couldn't wait to give. They were overcome with joy. <laughs> no wonder God was showering them with grace. The Bible says God loves a cheerful giver. <laughs> no doubt he was in love with the Macedonians attitude and character and mindset about giving. No doubt God's heart was pricked in heaven when he saw these trouble and trying and, and, and troubled on every side group of people church for that that just happy about giving back to him Amen. no doubt it welled up in God's heart welled up some tears in God's eyes no doubt he loves a cheerful giver <laughs> I want to be a cheerful giver don't you hallelujah and I didn't read anywhere in those five verses where it said Anybody was complaining. Nobody there was complaining about giving. Paul didn't mention anybody being stingy in that church. He didn't mention anybody about being selfish or angry or upset about giving. Paul said, I want to tell you something about the Macedonian church. That tells me that there was a one in that congregation. He said the whole entire Macedonian church. That means the whole entire congregation was of one mind, one purpose, one vision, one outlook, one mindset, one attitude, one character about giving back to the Lord. Hallelujah. The whole entire
entire Macedonian church was overcome with joy and couldn't wait to give back to the Lord. Hallelujah. Church, we need to learn somehow this attitude that the Macedonian church discovered or stepped into or I don't know how they gained it, but they have it. They love to give. Church, we need to learn this attitude about giving like the Macedonian church gave. We need to get in this mindset that the Macedonian church had in their mindset. How they thought about God and godly things. The ministry, the workers in the ministry, the workers in the kingdom. We need to follow that same mindset that church had where they gave freely, willingly, obediently. They gave without restraint. They gave joyfully and even beyond what they were expected to give. I want us to get in that mindset, church, to be like the Macedonian church in their giving. You know what happens when we don't sow? We are not going to harvest anything come harvest time. There is nothing could have sprung forward come harvest time if we never planted anything, if we never put away anything, if we never stored away anything. We can't be expecting a harvest come harvest season. A farmer knows not to eat his entire crop. I know this because my grandpa used to do that. He used to store seeds away during the winter time in our little shed that we had. He had groves and covered fulls of little cups of different um, seeds. And it wasn't labeled. He didn't know how to write it. He just knew by looking at it. He put a small, a small few seeds away like a small investment putting away into next year's harvest, into next year's season. That's what he was doing. He was putting just a little bit away from what he had this year, putting it away a little bit at a time for next year. And that little bit that he put away, guess what happened the following season? That one, that those few seeds that he put away and stored away, those few seeds produced five, some ten, maybe even a hundred fold in return in our harvest come fall season. Amen. What a perfect example of reaping, sowing, putting away, putting away. So the question I have for all of you here tonight, what are you sowing? How are you sowing? Where are you sowing? Or who are you sowing to? Why are you sowing? The Macedonians had the right attitude about giving. If we say, I can't afford to give, I don't have enough money to give guess what we're never going to get out of bondage we are never going to get out of our slavery we are never going to cut the chains loose off from us we are always going to be held down held back struggling trying the only way to get into a plentiful harvest, the only way to be victorious, the only way to step into our or your prosperity, and the only way for God to shower you with grace is through giving. That is the only way you are going to tap into those things of the Lord. Is the avenue, the ticket, the key is giving. How you give. Amen. Put that deep in your heart. Put that deep in your, in your soul, your mind, your spirit, your conscience. The only way to get a plentiful harvest, to be victorious, 
to step into your prosperity, to, for, for God to shower you with grace and all these things is through your giving. So what you offer and what you give back to the Lord, that shows where your heart is at. Let's look at Galatians chapter 5. Amen. Everybody there in Galatians chapter 5? Beginning at verse 7. It says, Do not be deceived. God is not to be mocked. And whatever a man sows, he will reap in return. Verse 8. The one who sows to please his flesh, from the flesh will reap destruction. But the one who sows to please the Spirit, from the Spirit will reap eternal life. Hallelujah. Let's look at that last verse, verse number five. Word of God goes on to say, and they, Paul saying, they exceeded our expectations. Paul was blown away and he said, they went above and beyond what we expected. They, they went above what I expected. They surprised me. They went out of their way. I wasn't expecting that Paul was saying. And then he says this, they gave themselves first of all to the Lord. And then by the will of God also to us. I think this is key. I think this is a key component or the place where true giving starts is when you give yourselves first of all to the Lord. I believe the day when you experience God, there is a relationship that clicks. There is something, there's some connection that is made with the Lord, God Almighty. Your whole outlook, your whole vision, your whole attitude, everything changes the moment you have your experience with God Almighty. And I believe that's what Paul is talking about. They gave themselves first of all to the Lord and then to us. That's why they were in the spirit of giving and they were beyond joyous to be giving back to God because they had an experience with God. It begins there, I believe, that is key. When our very first experience with the Lord, our first intimate experience with God. And I know every single one of you here have had that experience. Somehow, during service, wherever, however it may have been, you felt God talking at your heart. You felt God's, you heard God's still, small voice. That moment when we felt God that moment when we realized that, hey, God is real. I heard Him. He touched me. He moved. Why was I overwhelmed with this feeling, this emotion? Why was I crying? Why was my body trembling? Why was I feeling that way? Why was I overcome by these emotions? Amen. That moment when we felt God so near. How many of you had that experience? Sure, we all have, yes, at one point or another. For some, it might have been when we first repented here at the altar, when, when we, we, we returned from our sins at the altar. Maybe that was our first experience. For others, it may have been when we were coming out of that watery grave and baptism. That might have been your first. For others, it might have been when you were filled with this powerful spirit. Amen. Maybe that was your first intimate experience. 
we've all had one. It could have been for others when we knew that it could have only been God and nobody else. When you knew without a shadow of a doubt, nothing else could have, it had to have been God. Amen. Your first experience. Jesus. That time when he heard you, that time when he spoke to you, that time when he answered you, that time when he opened doors for you and he made a way for you, that day when he, he, he touched your heart. Maybe that day when you surrender in your, in your bedroom, when you're driving down the road, in, in your living room, wherever it may be. That day when you surrendered and gave your heart to God. Hallelujah. We've all had that experience. Amen. Yeah. So what happened with that first love experience? When we were overwhelmed by his presence that we couldn't contain it. What happened to that first love experience with the Lord? We've all had one. We've all experienced an intimate touch with God at one time or another. And based on that, why can't we give and why can't we offer back to Him freely and willingly and joyfully and beyond what is expected because we have that experience, because we know God is real? Why can't we give like the Macedonians? They felt God just like we feel Him. They've experienced God just like we've experienced Him. They spoke, God spoke to them as He speaks to us. What's so different about us? Where's our first love gone? You know what? We can tell you're giving by what you give to God. You know what God said in His Word? God Himself said, try me. Try me. That's a challenge. He said, try me. He said, test me. See if I won't open up the windows of heaven for you. Try me. You haven't even scratched your surface yet. You don't know what I'm capable of. You limit me. Remember, I'm God. There is nothing that I cannot do. There is nothing that is impossible for me. I keep every promises that I wrote in that word. I stand behind every word and every promise that I've made. Try me. Test me at my word. Test me in this. Remember Malachi chapter 3 verse 10 says, Bring all of your tithing into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Right there he says, And try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven, pour you out such a blessing that there will not be room enough for you to receive it. I didn't say that. I didn't write that. God Himself said that. The Almighty Himself said that to you and I. A challenge. You didn't take that challenge this year. Look at what He said next in the very next verse, verse 11. He says, if you do that, if you learn this, if you try it and test me, he says, I will rebuke the devourer for you so that it will not destroy the fruits of your land and the vines in your field and you and, and will not fail to produce fruit, says the Lord of hosts. Hallelujah. I want that promise. Oh, you want that promise? Don't you want to live like that? Don't you want to live in the fullness of what God would have us to live in? Look at what 2 Corinthians chapter 31 says. Beginning at... Actually, I didn't write the verse down. But 2 Corinthians 31 says, And moreover, He commanded the people that dwell in Jerusalem. Remember, Jerusalem is a type of church. He told those in the church to give the portion of their priests and the Levites that they might be encouraged in the law of the Lord. Proverbs 3 and verse 9 says, Honor the Lord with thy substance 
and with the first fruits of all thine increase. Amen. Psalms 37, it says, Trust in the Lord and do good. So shalt thou dwell in the land, and verily thou shalt be fed. And I close and I end with this last scripture in Deuteronomy chapter 28 and verse 12. It says, The Lord shall open unto thee his good treasure, the heaven to give the rain unto thy land in his season and to bless all the work of thine hand and thou shalt lend unto many nations and thou shalt not borrow hallelujah Woo, hallelujah what a word we've been challenged tonight how are you going to live the remaining months of this year you're going to live it down and defeated and unprosperous and unwilling and I want to live like the Macedonians lived just overjoyed when it came time to give overjoyed with joy abundantly when it came to the things of God when it came to the work of God it excited them it motivated them they were it was like infectious the joy that they fell into it spread from one to the other to the next and then for the whole the entire church to be overflowing with joy that says something it's infectious so it only starts with one it could be you the infection the good infection could start with you amen and it can filter through everybody here tonight and see where we end up if we take on that 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 test try me you gonna try me this year can we step into something different this year according to your finances in your finances? Can we step into something different? Yes. Let's really do that. Let's try. Let's test. Let's try God this year. Shall we? Yes. It doesn't take much like in our last. Jimmy, even just starts with $3 here and there. And this is our last lesson on finances and money. Next month, we'll, be, we'll begin our lesson in holiness. And this is our last. And I pray and I hope that this word stays with you, that you remember some things and, and uh, that you apply it, that you use it, and that you read it, and that you search the scriptures yourself. If you're serious and you want to change in your life, your home, your finances, and if you're tired of living paycheck to paycheck, I mean... There was promises. God said, try me, prove me. See if I can't open things up for you. Amen. That's a challenge. I, I challenge you to challenge God's word this year. Amen. Are you willing to do that? Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus.